Welcome, my friends, to Inside the Minds of Authors. I'm Daisy Gomez, and I'm thrilled you're joining me today for a fun conversation with a passionate author. We're kicking off the program like it's our tradition with a short reading from the feature book. I hope you guys enjoy it. Let's get started. Hello, my name is Patty Wiseman. I live in Woodlawn, Texas. It's a spot in the road, and if you blink, you'll miss it. But we love it out here. I'm going to read to you today the first chapter of Silver's Redemption. And it's about an older woman that has issues with the way the world sometimes treats older women. <laughs> so here we go. Silver's Redemption. Chapter one, two ragtag coyotes crouched beyond the sun-bleached wooden fence, waiting, ears tilted forward, wary, hungry, poised to take advantage. Georgiana Fellows, or Silver, as her friends call her, fired a bolt-action rifle into the air to scare the mangy creatures off. The crack of the shot echoed for miles. Not this time, fellas. Besides, you would want Joey to get a hold of she hollered after the fleeing critters. She turned back to the mule. Time to lock you in for the night, old friend. Those boys must be awful hungry if they've come to prey on you. She slid from the jagged boulder just in front of the dilapidated cabin deep in the West Texas mountain. After watching the night sky emerge from the fading light, as it did every evening, the sun gave up its abundance of vibrant colors in a final showdown of the most beautiful sunsets in the world. As if to say, cough, back. She usually loved this dusky interim between day and night. For all its beauty and vain glorious efforts, the blue skies of Texas didn't compare with the unpretentious arrival of what is, for lack of a better word, the universe. In the most glorious sunset, the most beautiful blue skies, and the fluffy drifting of a white cloud, you only see as far as the blueness. But when the night sky makes its grateful entrance, another dimension reveals itself. Tonight, however, nothing moved her. The mountains didn't erase the scenes embedded in her mind. The nightly vigil wore thin as she led Joey to the small weather-beaten barn and secured the rusty lock on the door. The barn needs paint. The door needs new hinges. After years of neglect, a mountain of work faced her. She was weary, tired of the isolation, rationing food, and probably worst of all, the lack of companionship. More than once, she kicked herself for making such a knee-jerk decision to give up and come to West Texas to find an abandoned silver mine on the land her father left her. The most discouraging part was she hadn't even found it yet. Days of bouncing along in the battered old Jeep she procured in town left her discouraged. He didn't leave her a map, only something scribbled on a piece of paper that suggested the location. To the left of the camel rock, a rock shaped like a camel? What did that mean? Am I really such a failure, even at finding the line? The humiliation she suffered back east took a toll on an otherwise strong constitution. For a while, she pretended the age-related rebuff didn't happen until she couldn't anymore. 56 years old, and they tell me I no longer fit the company image. All the while, my replacement simpers beside Steve Walker with her flowing blonde hair, 42-inch implant, red stilettos, and a snarky smile on her unwrinkled face. So much for loyalty from my boss. Silver packed up her office belongings that day and went home. Alone in the penthouse-style apartment she purchased 10 years ago, the carefully chosen decor did nothing 
to lift her spirits. If anything, it depressed her even more. Stainless steel kitchen, white cabinet, a hint of red in the flowers and hand towels. The living room was all white, rug, desk, sofa. What was she thinking? No personality. All of it suddenly meant nothing considering what she endured on her last day at that office. What had she worked for all these years? How did she arrive at this point in her life, alone and replaced by a younger woman? Darkness fell, but she didn't turn on the light. Instead, hid under a white blanket on the alabaster sofa until morning. As the sun came up, she took a long look in the mirror and studied the reflection. Short cropped silver hair, thus the nickname, fine laugh lines around eyes the color of maple sugar, straight white teeth. And suddenly, she knew what to do. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Inside the Minds of Authors. Welcome to another exciting episode. And today, I am so thrilled and excited to have the fabulous Patty with us today. Hi, Madam. How are you? Hi, DC. I'm so good. Thank you for having me. It is such a pleasure. I have been following you actually for a couple of years. I stumbled upon one of the groups that you were running on Facebook and I was like, oh my God, you are so much fun. So the fact that we finally connected is an honor. Super happy to have you. So before I go straight fangirl, let's get to the point. How about we find out a little bit about this book? Give us a little bit of the background. Where did this book come from? How did you come up with this idea? Well, it's Silver's Redemption. and I have written other books, but they were always in the 20 to 30 age group. And I'm an older lady now, <laughs> retired from a 25 year career in finance and finally doing what I love. It was suggested to me that I write about an older woman. The difficulties we seem to have in today's society, which is dominated by the influencers of the young and restless, I guess. <laughs> I had had a similar experience as I portrayed in this book at my retirement. I was kind of not asked to retire, but it was made very difficult for me because they wanted to bring in a younger person. That kind of stuck in my mind. And so that was how the premise of this story comes along. Now, she is 56. I made it that age because she was still actually in the work environment where I was on the cusp of retirement when I had a similar experience. I didn't go searching for a silver mine, though. <laughs> That's what silver does. It's interesting because we have so many generations now in the workforce. So it has become such an interesting dynamics. What do we do? So to see the story come into life and such a, I would like to say very much on point topic for today's society, because we're living it. And you don't hear anybody telling a guy, you're too old, you need to go. Why does it happen uh, to women? Yeah, absolutely correct. Yes, it's really unfair, but it is the truth of it. It is interesting because we're always competing for those jobs. We're always competing for the promotions. And then what happens to be more interesting, we're competing with each other because it seems that they keep pushing us to compete, whether we like it or not. Exactly. What I find interesting is that they disregard the experience and that we have garnered over the years of our career and the stumbling blocks that we have overcome and how much value that brings to the younger generation. If the younger generation would just take advice and work together. I hope this isn't the last book I write for an older woman. Then I'm even going to maybe bump up the age a little bit because I'm in my seventies now and still going strong and loving what I do. And I wondered to myself, DC, why didn't I write books earlier in my life? I could have dozens of books. Here again, we find that you have to have the life experience in order to portray that in your books. 
So I think I'm in the right place at the right time. I read a book by Eckhart Tolle that says, there is no coincidence in life and you're having the experience you're supposed to have. So his power of now is powerful, but you are. You're exactly what you're supposed to have. And there's some things, especially in the writing, that sometimes becomes so much more authentic because you felt it. It is those emotions that you've been there and you're conveying it to the world. You took a topic, you took this leap of faith, which I love. And then you set her in the strangest of places. You sent her to West Texas. There's nothing there. Why West Texas? Why a silver mine? I wanted to put her in the most remote place she could be because she was so devastated by how she was let go from her high profile job. And she just wanted to retreat from society. And in the mountains, you just don't have society out there. There's not internet and that kind of thing. She is 25 miles from a town called Diamond Gulch, which is a fictional town. There is going to be a love interest in her life. But West Texas and a silver mine, I named her Silver before I even thought of a silver mine. Her name is Georgiana, but everybody called her Silver because she was prematurely gray and white headed. They called her Silver as a nickname. So that's how I came up with Silver Mine and the title of the book. And I wanted her to experience two extreme situations in her life which she went from the hustle and bustle of the East Coast to being in the thick of the competition all those years to absolutely nothing and how she rebuilt her life. Of course, I wanted to write in Texas. I live in Texas, so I wanted to write a story that involved Texas. And Texas is so diverse. You've got mountains, you've got desert, you've got big cities, and it's so huge. That's why I put her out there. I did my research on where silver is mined, and they used to mine silver out in West Texas. I drew that all together to make it believable. I love the fact that you're bringing her to Texas because it is, it is such a diverse state. I write East Texas, like literally East corner of Texas. But to me, it is that beautiful thing about you're in the desert. We have small cities. We have tiny towns, everything in between. And it's the beauty of writing. You can create an entire universe in the most smallest places. So tell me, madame, are you thinking of making this a series? I could because at the end of the book, she, I'm not going to give it away, but she does discover a new career, if you will. But I leave it there. I don't embellish on how she goes about doing that. So it's like what happened in my first series. I have a five book historical fiction series set in the 1920s. In the first book I wrote about it, I was going to be a standalone and I was going to move on. But I had so much good response from it that they asked me to write another one, like fans. And I ended up writing five books so that you bring that up about silver. It's quite possible that I'll delve into the next book with her in her new career and her new love life, which by the way, I want to mention, he's six years younger than she is. I wanted to put that in there because my actual husband is six years younger than me and we've been married for 29 years. So it can work. When you get to those ages, age doesn't have anything to do with it. Yeah. So I gave her a, a younger man. <laughs> I love it. You're touching on all these different topics that most people are going, really? But you are so right. I think once we pass a certain age, age becomes a little different. They're very mature and people can relate on a different level. So I love it. And congratulations on your marriage. That is fabulous. You've been writing now multiple genres because you did historical fictions. Now you're doing contemporary. Which one do you enjoy the most? I have to say historical. I love history. And in my first series set in the 1920s, they were actually based on my grandmother's stories that I'd heard while I was hiding under the staircase in her big three-story farmhouse. She would regale us with stories of how she was a flapper in the 1920s. Her marriage was arranged, and that was true. 
and my father was the product of that marriage. And so all my life, I'd wanted to write, but life gets in the way. And I had a career and husband and children and all of that. Never got to do it until I retired. But I remembered her stories. I am sad because she passed years ago and I never got to really pick her brain about that story. So I had to do a lot of research. But I have to say, historical is always my favorite. Although I really, really enjoyed writing Silver's Redemption. <laughs> What's a flapper? The Charleston, the way they dress in that day, the headband. In the feather and the shimmery dress were called flappers back then. Just contemporary women that were finding their way in that era. I really oh. admired them because they were trailblazers, really. That is so awesome. Once you described it, I was like, that is such an amazing story. And the fact that you had firsthand knowledge of somebody who's been in that generation and truly changed the world, because that is the cusp in our history when you're looking at women saying we're going to make a difference and we're going to change so I totally agree love the fact that you do historical fiction it is a lot of time and research I'm glad you enjoy it how long does it usually take to research one of your historical fiction books probably it takes me a year to complete a book because of the research even the contemporary takes me about a year. Now I see people that write a book in three months and put out five books a year or something like that. I just simply can't do that. I don't know <laughs> if I'm just slow or what, but I tend to be more meticulous in my historical or factual things. I want it to fit, to make sense. The beautiful thing about writing, there is no competition and no rush. Everybody has their own pace and their own kind of flow to it. So you understand your process and you understand how that one flows. So enjoy it, madame. It is perfectly fine and amazing. <laughs> what are you working on now? Because I have done historical, I've done contemporary, I've done romantic mystery, and I've done a children's book. I've also done a ghost book. Now I'm spreading my wings and I'm doing a fantasy book and she's an evil mermaid. <laughs> this one, I have to say, is harder for me to write because I never even considered doing fantasy before, but I'm one to challenge myself. And because I've succeeded in challenging myself on other genres, I thought I'm going to take this on. I'm thankful that I have a critique group that they will check me and say, oh no, you can't do this as far as the fantasy part of it is. But you do get to create your own world, so to speak. And the world building is the fun part, but I've never seen, and maybe they're out there. I just haven't seen them, a book about a wicked or evil verbiage. Usually you have your protagonist always going to be sweet and amazing and you will have something bad happening, but an evil one is kind of fun. You're twisting the whole concept of what we think of mermaids and how sweet they're going to be. I love the fact that you're taking this challenge, that you decided, you know what, I haven't done this and we're going to do it. What made you decide to do it? Like I said, I'm 73 and I'm not done yet. Okay. <laughs> And I, like I said before, wanted to challenge myself. And I will say there's another reason that I wanted to go this direction. The fifth book in my historical fiction series, the cover of that book is actually my granddaughter that posed for it. And she is in her senior year. She graduates this year. She's a theater major. And I asked her to pose for my cover. And she did an excellent job. It's a beautiful cover. I just love it. It's called An Unlikely Elegance, and she is very elegant. When I thought about what I could really stretch myself to, I thought of using her again as the mermaid. On the other book she did, she's got a profile. This one, she's going to be full face. She has long auburn hair, and she's just beautiful. I'm looking forward to putting that cover together. I write that book with her in mind. I hate that she's evil, but she is. <laughs> it's going to bring a different quality to it. But what advice would you give an up-and-coming author? 
Well, that's a good question. I do give advice to a lot of new authors. And I think the one thing that really helped me jump in with both feet was to find a writing group. I am a past president of East Texas Writers Association in Longview, Texas. I was a member for years before I did a three-year stint as president. And that writing group has helped me immensely with the stumbling blocks and the things that you just don't know going into it, marketing, publishing, all of that. There's always somebody in the group that has expertise on one subject or another. Another thing is a good critique group. They keep you honest. They keep you to the letter of writing and catch your mistakes and that kind of thing. To me, that's invaluable. I've been writing for 12 years and I couldn't do it without the support, the critique group, the East Texas Writers Association. So jump in with both feet and stay in front of your computer on a regular basis and write whether it's good or bad. You can always go back and fix it. That is such an awesome advice. And sometimes I think people have that fear where do I start? So to have a group, to have a writer's community that can help you and guide you and when you get lost, you can raise your hand and be like, somebody point me into the right direction is beautiful. And you have been doing this for a while. So you know the importance of it. Where can our listeners find your books? Where can they learn more about you? Well, I have a website. It's pattywiseman.com. I'm on Facebook, all over Facebook. I even have a podcast. Yeah, I haven't done anything with it in about a year because uh, of health issues. But uh, there are quite a few episodes on there. It's called Patty's Musings. You can find it on Spotify or Anchor. I tell short stories on there. I don't ramble on about writing, but I am trying to make it entertaining. And I'm trying to get back to it. But the medication that I have to take messes with my voice sometimes. And... <laughs> I'm really anxious to get back to that. So there's the podcast, I'm on Instagram, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm just everywhere. Just type my name in and you'll find me. I love the fact that you are easily accessible. People can find you in the same handle, Patty Wiseman. And the fact that you read short stories is awesome to me. It's such an inspiration. I had the crazy idea that I'm going to start doing that on Facebook. And I was like, am I really doing this? So you are motivating me to go like, okay, take a leap. You can do this. It will be okay. Good for you. Madam, before you leave us, I am so grateful you joined us and so inspired, but we're going to jump to our lightning round. Are you ready? I hope so. <laughs> Easy peasy. Don't think too much about this. Water or juice? It has to be water. Nice. Cats or dogs? Cats. Me too. Hooray. <laughs> Early bird or night owl? Early bird. My kind of lady. Love it. Hiking or camping? Hiking. I used to camp years ago with my father, but I, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> the fact that you camp, you get extra points for that. I'm like, oh, that sounds like work. Yeah. Here's our last one. And this is a little different. This is going to be focused on your main character in your book. If your main character had a song, what would be the theme song? Oh, wow. What would be the theme song? You know, I've been listening Lately, there's a YouTube video on features Al Green back in the 1990s on the David Letterman show. And he sang the best rendition I've ever heard of Let's Stay Together. And Aww. I think that's the theme song that I would choose for my characters. Let's stay together. I love it. That is also so powerful, madame. Awesome. Miss Patty, do you have any closing remarks for us? Just that I really, really appreciate you having me here. I hope that people will check out my books and I like them to keep in touch with me. So you can find my email or, or Facebook or whatever and let me know what you think. My listeners, you heard her. You have an invitation to not only follow, but also to contact Miss Patty and pay in touch. Madame, thank you so much for joining us. Truly a pleasure and an honor having you. You are still killing it. And yes, you have many, many more books ahead of you. So please keep writing. My thank friends, you. Make, to our listeners, make sure you give us a like, share the episode, 
invite others to join our community. A huge shout out to our Patreon community for their amazing support in the podcast. If you want to join us, the link is in the comments. And I'll be back next week with another amazing author. Bye, everyone. Ooh.